Hello, and we welcome you to the RPTS webinar series. Have uh, quite an interesting presentation for you today, uh, something that I think you will find uh, quite interesting. So uh, we will be hearing from Dr. Wayne Spear, Professor Emeritus of Systematic Theology here at the Reformed Presbyterian Theological Seminary. And I believe, Dr. Spear, you came on faculty probably in 1970 for the first time. So uh, Dr. Spear has pastoral experience in uh, Minnesota, California, Indiana, Pennsylvania. Uh, educationally, Dr. Spear graduated from Geneva College and from this seminary here. Uh, also did a THM at Westminster Theological Seminary and a doctorate from the University of Pittsburgh. Well, Dr. Spear is uh, well known among uh, Reformed Presbyterians for uh, his uh, gentlemanly scholarship in a variety of different topics, but particularly uh, as we look at the Westminster Assembly, uh, there are several books that uh, Dr. Spear has uh, authored through the years, and uh, some of those include Faith of Our Fathers, an excellent commentary of the Westminster Confession of Faith, and then a great book on the theology of prayer called Talking to God. Uh, the Spears, uh, Dr. Spear is married, uh, his wife Mary, uh, and they have five children, and I believe 28 grandchildren and six great-grandchildren. So uh, the quiver is full, and uh, it must be quite exciting at uh, Thanksgiving time. Uh, that's a big table for that many people. Well, Dr. Spear would tell you great stories of his time here at uh, the Reformed Presbyterian Theological Seminary, including working on his transmission actually in the room that we're in right now. So uh, next time you see him personally, you should ask about that. But we're here today to speak specifically about uh, this work, Covenanted Uniformity in Religion, uh, the influences of the Scottish Commissioners on the Ecclesiology of the Westminster Assembly. That is quite a title, and it is quite a book. This is part of the, the Westminster Assembly project published by Reformation Heritage Books. So as a brief introduction, it's a common view that the Westminster Assembly was dominated by Scots pursuing their nationalistic goals to the disadvantage of a desperate English parliament. But Dr. Spear reassesses the assembly from the standpoint of the Scottish commissioners and their influence in the drawing up of the form of church government. Sinclair Ferguson of uh, Redeemer Theological Seminary notes, carefully researched and written with a gracious clarity this book is enormously helpful in walking us through the long and complex debates on church government in which the Westminster divines engaged. Well, a little bit later in our conversation today, you will have an opportunity uh, to ask Dr. Spear some questions about this presentation. There's a chat feature, a question feature in your software uh, in your online deck. So uh, as you come up with those questions, uh, or if you need some help in navigating uh, the software, just uh, type those in there, and uh, we will help you with that. And you'll have your opportunity then to uh, interact with uh, Dr. Spear. So without any further ado, uh, Dr. Wayne Spear. Well, I'm happy for an uh, opportunity to uh, talk about uh, this book, which is my doctoral dissertation. It's a, a source of some amazement to me that uh, this now appears in print after 37 years. It was completed in 1976, and uh, it's a, a delight to me to see it in this form, and I want to express appreciation, especially to Dr. John Bauer, who is an adjunct professor here who really took the initiative in getting this printed, published as a part of the Westminster Project. 
Uh, Chad Van Dixhorn had some uh, role in it, I believe, and also Joel Beakey, who's the head of Reformation Heritage uh, Publications. And uh, so my appreciation to them. And uh, she's here today. I also ought to express my appreciation to my wife, Mary, who typed this dissertation in pre-computer days on a royal standard typewriter, not electric, uh, three times, I think. And uh, so I'm really appreciative, appreciative of her work. I'm going to uh, give an introduction, and then we'll uh, go through the uh, substance of the book briefly. Um, the title, Covenanted uh, Uniformity in Religion, uh, comes from a phrase in the Solemn League and Covenant, which I'll talk about in a minute, um, which uh, said that the uh, nations of England, Scotland, and Ireland were pledged to uh, seek the nearest conjunction and uniformity in religion in the, in the three kingdoms. And the uh, Solemn League and Covenant went on to specify uh, what became the documents of the assembly, confession of faith, form of church government, directory for worship, and catechizing. And I found the same expression in a number of other places among the seceders in Scotland in 1743. Uh, there was uh, a solemn covenanting occasion in which uh, the seceders promised to promote and advance our covenanted conjunction and uniformity in religion. And again went on to mention the documents of the Westminster Assembly. I want to uh, talk a little bit about how uh, the thesis came to be written I had been asked by the Synod of the Reformed Presbyterian Church to go to graduate school to get ready to teach here in the seminary. And uh, after I completed the master's degree in Philadelphia in Westminster, uh, I needed a place to do my doctoral work. And for geographical reasons, I chose Pittsburgh Seminary, which had entered into a joint doctoral program with the University of Pittsburgh. And that was so I could begin teaching while I was completing my uh, doctoral work. And in God's providence, that worked out very well. In fact, better than I anticipated. I had had an interest in the Westminster Assembly, also in the doctrine of the church. And uh, so that's the way in which I began thinking about a dissertation. Uh, I began to work on the form of Presbyterial Church government, which was the first document uh, produced by the Westminster Assembly. And it turned out that there was more than enough work to be done just on that document. So as usually happens in a thesis project, there was a narrowing of the scope uh, to uh, deal with uh, that document, which had never been, in my knowledge, uh, uh, subjected to any scholarly study uh, before this time. Uh, and uh, there were some blessings in that choice of Pittsburgh uh, Seminary that I didn't realize at the time. My professor, my, the chairman of my committee was Dr. Robert Paul, and uh, I didn't know about this going in, but he was then in the process of writing a book on the Westminster Assembly. It's uh, published under the title, The Assembly of the Lord. And so I was able to work with a man who was intimately familiar with the working of the uh, Westminster Assembly. And he was very kind to me personally, and uh, so that was a big help. I also had the privilege of having Ford Battles on my committee. Uh, Dr. Battles, perhaps the foremost Calvin scholar in the world at that time, and uh, he also was a, a great help to me. 
I became aware as I worked on the uh, form of church government that uh, there were, was available in microfilm form the unpublished minutes of the Westminster Assembly, the first uh, uh, year or two of the Assembly, about 1,400 pages handwritten, uh, not always very legible, but uh, that became the main resource that I used in uh, seeking to understand this document of the uh, Westminster Assembly. And a dissertation has to try to prove something. And so it's not simply a study of that document, but also examines this uh, fairly common idea that uh, the uh, Scots had a, a heavy hand in the Westminster Assembly and uh, led it to, to uh, produce things which were not really compatible with the uh, majority of the folks in England where the assembly was held. And I'll talk more about that at the end of the lecture. Let me say a word uh, about the Westminster Assembly and its historical setting. Uh, not everybody listening to this may be familiar uh, with this or needs uh, some review. The assembly met in Westminster Abbey, hence the name of the assembly, uh, beginning in July 1, 1643, and continuing for about five and a half years. The assembly met uh, during a time of civil war in England. The uh, English Parliament, especially the House of Commons, was dominated by Puritans, and they clashed with Charles I, the King of England, about many things, including uh, the church and religion. And uh, so as uh, there came to be a revolution, it was really that, a revolution against uh, Charles and his government, um, they, uh, as a part of that, the parliament uh, removed from office the bishops of the Church of England who had been Charles's uh, strongest allies. And so the Church of England, the National Church of England, was really without a government. And the English Parliament called the Westminster Assembly together to advise the Parliament about what uh, government in the church should be set up uh, in place of the one that had been removed. Um, they also anticipated uh, some changes in the liturgy of the church. They did not at the beginning anticipate uh, producing a confession of faith, which uh, really became in God's providence the uh, major uh, product of uh, this Westminster Assembly. Uh, the assembly uh, was under the direction of the parliament. This was in the time when there was uh, union of church and state. Uh, there was one national church, and uh, the parliament would direct as to what the government of the church would be. And uh, so uh, this document was produced as a part of the advice of the Westminster Assembly to the English Parliament uh, about what the government of the Church of England should be. Originally, the Assembly was entirely English, but in 1643, uh, the Parliament was losing in the Civil War. And so they sought the help of Scotland to uh, gain a victory over Charles in this struggle. And they did that because the Scots had already successfully revolted against the, the government of Charles in 1638 and in the church had reestablished the Presbyterian church government and they were militarily uh, strong for a small nation. And uh, so England sought their help. The treaty which brought Scotland into the war was called the Solemn League and Covenant, which pledged uh, 
uh, England, Scotland, and Ireland, as I have said, to seek uniformity in religion. Uh, Ireland was included in that without Ireland's consent, uh, and uh, so it was really primarily between Scotland and England. Because of that agreement then, uh, commissioners were sent from the Church of Scotland to the Westminster Assembly, and there uh, they were not voting members of the Assembly, but they had uh, great influence because of their writings and because of their participation in committee work and in the debates of the Westminster Assembly. The assembly produced seven major documents. Uh, five are well known, two not so well known. The ones who are known, who are well known, are the form of Presbyterian church government, the Directory for Worship, the Directory for Government. That's uh, one not very well known. The uh, Confession of Faith, the larger and shorter catechisms, and Interestingly, for Reformed Presbyterians, a metrical psalter because uh, the Puritans and the Scottish Covenanters were, of course, psalm singers. And uh, when the uh, Directory for Worship mentions psalm singing, they mean just that, the singing of the, one, of the uh, 150 psalms of uh, the Old Testament. Well, I want to say a word about the organization and operation of the assembly. Named in the ordinance, which called the assembly into being, were 120 English ministers, 20 members of the House of Commons, and 10 members of the House of Lords. Uh, they, that, that many were named, but the attendance was not so large. The uh, king forbade uh, those who were called to the assembly to participate, and some of them obeyed the king. And the result was that the usual attendance in the assembly was about 60, perhaps a, a little more than that. It required 40 to have a quorum, and there were times when they uh, were not able to officially meet because they did not have a quorum. The assembly was organized into three general committees. And every member of the assembly was assigned to one of those committees. And uh, part of my sense of the assembly as a whole is that it was a learning process. Uh, this uh, way of structuring the assembly did not really work very well for the production of the form of church government. Uh, all three committees considered the same subjects, and then they would report to the assembly. So the assembly was uh, led into duplication because they would complete work on the report of one committee, and then another committee would bring up the same subject uh, again, and if there had been disagreement the first time, that got uh, reduplicated in the second time around, and so on. Uh, later, when they worked on the confession of faith, they developed a different procedure. There was a small drafting committee that did the initial writing, and uh, then uh, that material went to the three general committees for their review and then to the assembly. And having a small drafting committee really uh, led to a much more coherent uh, discussion and a more coherent document. So one of the practical uh, things uh, that I learned in doing this study is that uh, deliberative bodies need to think about their procedures and uh, can learn to do things more effectively and more efficiently if they pay attention to procedure. Uh, there, are, uh, there were a number of committees called Committees of Accommodation. 
And uh, this is an interesting thing about the assembly because such committees were appointed when there was when there were differences in the assembly which they uh, could not reconcile. So they would appoint a special committee to come up with compromise language. Now I know for uh, some people the idea of compromise is not a good thing, but it's a historical fact that the assembly often operated in this way to find language that was flexible enough that those who had some differences could uh, still give their assent to it. And then uh, there were two different editorial committees. And uh, in my judgment, these editorial committees uh, were the least effective of uh, the committees in the assembly uh, part of my conclusion was that they did not do a very good job on this document. As I say uh, in the book, the form of church government is a virtual mosaic whose bits and pieces are the sentences debated and passed by the assembly over a period of many months. And the editors then sometimes placed sentences in different contexts than those in which they were originally debated. And they also made changes in wording that changed, in some cases, the intended meaning of the sentences that they were dealing with. And uh, because of this, the uh, form of church government really has the marks of an unfinished work. The assembly went on to produce another document called the Directory for Church Government, which is a much more coherent document. And uh, yet, because it was never approved by the English Parliament and did not go to Scotland for approval, uh, it has uh, generally fallen out of the consciousness of people. In, in fact, Dr. Paul, my chairman, who was an expert on the Westminster Assembly, had forgotten of, of the existence of that document. Uh, it has been recently republished. I was able to uh, include a chapter in a book called Pressing Toward the Mark, uh, produced by the Orthodox Presbyterian Church, a uh, 50-year history of that church. And uh, so... Uh, that document of the assembly, which is otherwise uh, rather obscure, is now available in this volume. Well, that much about the pr procedure and organization. Uh, just uh, a brief word about the Scottish commissioners uh, upon whom I focused in this work. There were four ministers, Alexander Henderson, who was the oldest and the most uh, active leader of the delegation. Samuel Rutherford, well known for his um, letters, his devotional letters. Um, George Gillespie, who was about 26 years old and the ablest debater uh, among the Scots rep Scottish representatives. And Robert Bailey, who never spoke in the assembly, but was very active behind the scenes, and he wrote uh, many letters and kept a journal. And uh, the letters and journals of Robert Bailey are one of the primary uh, historical sources for uh, the Westminster Assembly. There were two elders, uh, John Lord Maitland, who later became the Duke of Lauderdale. And this is a sad part of the story because uh, later on, uh, after the restoration of Charles II, he became the uh, right-hand man of Charles II in his persecution of the Puritans and the Covenanters and uh, was responsible for some of the suffering of the killing times uh, which comes after the Westminster Assembly. Uh, Archibald Johnston was a lawyer uh, 
have been the clerk of the General Assembly of the Church of Scotland uh, during the Second Reformation, and uh, he was actually executed later after the assembly um, for his participation in this act of uh, rebellion against the king. Well, now I want to uh, go through the sections of the document. Uh, Those who may see this later, if you have uh, access to that document, it's found in the standard collection of documents uh, usually published under the title of the Confession of Faith. This is the version by the Free Presbyterian Church of Scotland. might be helpful to you to have the document uh, before you. Um, and there are several parts of it. Uh, first, uh, let me talk about the church and its officers. Uh, the whole document begins with a preface, which is an interesting uh, collation of biblical passages which uh, trace the source of church government to the exalted Lord Jesus Christ. It's uh, the practice in the Reformed Presbyterian Church and others, I think, to um, perform official actions with the formula in the name and by the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ, Zion's only king and head. And uh, that comes out of what is here in the form of church government. The preface puts together passages from Isaiah 9 about uh, the government being on the, the shoulder of the Messiah. Uh, Matthew 28, all authority is given unto me in heaven and earth. Uh, Ephesians 1, which speaks about the exaltation of Christ to a place of rule above all authority and power. And Ephesians 4, that talks about the risen Christ giving to the church the gifts of its officers. And so there's an interesting collation of those passages uh, to biblically trace the origin of church power and church government to the Lord Jesus Christ. There's a section on the church, and uh, throughout this section, uh, the document uses the term the visible church. It begins by speaking of one general church visible. And uh, the use of that language implies uh, the fact that the assembly made use of the distinction between the visible and the invisible church, which, uh, if not earlier, is found in Calvin and his institutes and uh, in discussion both of the invisible and the visible church. But of course, in a document about church government, that means the church here on the earth, and so there is a focus on the visible church. Two main points in this section that I want to mention. First, that there is a church beyond There was a small but uh, vocal minority in the assembly that were known as the independents, and uh, uh, they thought that the whole power of the church was in the local congregation. And so this idea of a general church visible was to say uh, there is a church beyond the local congregation and uh, that needs uh, that local congregations are only a part of that larger church, and that's one of the principles of Presbyterianism. And then they spoke in this section about membership in the church, that it is to be made up of visible saints. And by that they meant those who profess the true faith, the true Christian faith, and were free from scandalous sins, and because they believed in covenant theology, they also concluded the children of such people within the visible church. 
it's implied in this, and it's clear in the discussion of it, that they did not believe that evidence of conversion was required for church membership. They were aiming for a national church that would embrace nearly the whole population of their respective nations. And if you're going to have that kind of comprehensive church, then it's not to be expected that uh, everyone in the church or most in the church would be those who were true believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, I think most Presbyterian churches since then, at least conservative ones, have uh, moved at least to the point of saying we ought to inquire of prospective members uh, whether they have saving faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, not that we can see their hearts clearly, but that we can at least ask for their profession. Then the officers of the church, and the, uh, the document distinguishes between extraordinary officers, apostles, prophets, and evangelists, and the ordinary offices. Incidentally, they did not uh, discuss, they discussed the office of apostle but not of prophets and evangelists. Um, but they did uh, rather extensive discussion of the ordinary offices, pastors, teachers, other church governors, that's the language they used, and deacons. Pastors were responsible for prayer, for public reading of Scripture, for preaching, for catechizing, administering the sacraments, pronouncing the benediction, caring for the poor, interestingly, though they had discussion as to in what way the pastor would do that, by teaching others to do it or by his own personal involvement, and then also a ruling function. Teachers were a distinct office in the view of the assembly. Going back to Calvin's view in uh, the Institute's and this based upon Ephesians 4.11 that talked about pastors and teachers in the uh, older translation. And so they regarded those as two different offices. But there was ambiguity regarding the sphere of service of these offices as to whether uh, it was to be in the congregation or in the schools. And uh, both for Calvin and for John Knox, the place of service of teachers was in schools uh, organized by the church and answerable uh, to the church, uh, and that would include in the training of ministers uh, in the universities. But uh, since it was left uh, ambiguous, and since the assembly said that teachers uh, had the right to administer the sacraments, the uh, distinction between pastor and teacher uh, was blurred. And in fact, that may fit in my judgment with the meaning of Ephesians 4, which has a different grammatical in, uh, construction when it talks about pastors and teachers, and uh, so uh, seem to indicate that those two functions go together. Then they had extensive debates about what they called church government, uh, church governors. They used the word elders, but reluctantly. There was a rather strong resistance among the English to the office of ruling elder. Some held to it. Others were, uh, were not so sure it was a biblical office. Uh, when they talked about these church governors or elders, uh, they based uh, such an office on 1 Timothy 5.17 that talks about those who rule well in distinction from those who labor in the word and doctrine. Also, uh, Romans 12 and 1 Corinthians 12, where the uh, gifts for uh, ruling are mentioned in those two lists of gifts. They did not, interestingly, as is commonly done today, refer to 1 Timothy 3 and Titus 1 
as giving qualifications for ruling elders. He understood those passages as referring to ministers and not to ruling elders. And the fourth office was that of deacons. Uh, I found there were three views about the office of deacon uh, within the assembly. Uh, some thought uh, the office of deacon was a stepping stone to becoming a pastor. That had been the practice in the Episcopal government of the Church of England. Every minister had first been ordained a deacon, and some uh, who had gone through that process still believed that. Others thought the deacons were simply assistants to pastors in whatever way they needed assistance. And the third view that was that the distinctive office of deacon was to care for the poor. And the assembly decided on that view of the office of deacon based upon Acts chapter 6. As a historical footnote, Related to contemporary discussions, uh, the Westminster Assembly actually voted in favor of women deacons by a majority of one. And uh, in the uh, editing process, that reference to deaconesses was quietly dropped, and so it does not appear in the document. Then a section on the local church, and they talked about whether membership should be fixed or not. Uh, on the continent, say in the city of Rotterdam, all of the, the uh, church members were, uh, were regarded in general as uh, the church in Rotterdam, but there were distinct uh, churches where worship services were held, and you could go back and forth between one and another. And the assembly was aware of that, but they decided that there ought to be per, uh, distinct, specific membership of particular congregations for expedient reasons, that is, for the care of souls and for the administration of church discipline. Elders needed to know for whom they were responsible, and so there ought to be a list of members. The assembly decided that the churches ought to be divided geographically, and so they wanted to continue the parochial system uh, that had been uh, the case in the Church of England. And this was against what was called the gathering of churches practiced by the independents, in which if your, if your parish minister was a supporter of the bishop's or of uh, high ceremonialism, or did not preach the gospel, you would leave your parish and go to another place where there was a godly minister. And while the assembly did not absolutely forbid that, uh, they did uh, come down in favor of a parochial system. And they said with regard to officers of a local congregation, there needs to be one pastor at least, and others to govern and to care for the poor. They mentioned the ordinances of a local church, which are simply parts of worship, uh, which occur again in the directory for worship. And then long discussions about governing assemblies. Uh, they talked first about uh, what they called congregational assemblies, uh, local sessions, and what power they had. They decided that local sessions had power to summon people to appear before them to inquire into the knowledge and the spiritual condition of members under their care. That was a shepherding function. And then in matters of discipline, the power of admonition and rebuke and suspension from the Lord's Supper, but not excommunication. That belonged, as they decided later, to the presbytery. And then a long discussion of what they called classical assemblies or presbyteries. And here there was a surprising uh, diversity of opinion, especially uh, led by the independents. And uh, so they debated the proposition, many 
particular congregations may be under one presbyterial government. And uh, that's, a, that's not a strong statement. May be under one presbyterial government, but they uh, passed that based upon the approved examples of the churches in Jerusalem and in Ephesus where their argument was uh, there were too many people, uh, too many Christians in those places to be... Uh, to meet together in one congregation, so there must have been many uh, or several congregations and yet under one Presbyterian government. And then briefly, they talked also about synodical assemblies, uh, that is, higher courts, the uh, provincial, provincial assembly or a synod, the general assembly in a nation, and they even contemplated beyond that an ecumenical assembly. And uh, there was some hope still alive at that time that the differences that had come since the Reformation could be resolved by a worldwide or at least European uh, assembly of representatives of the churches. And then uh, they had a long section on ordination. And... Uh, I want to mention there, because I'm running out of time, uh, uh, part of what they said was that, def that ordination meant the solemn setting apart of a person to some public office in the church, quite a general statement. But after that, in the document, all the statements about ordination belong to the ordination of ministers. Uh, that ordination was... Uh, done by the presbytery, not by the local session, with the laying on of hands. However, the consent of the congregation uh, was required uh, as a part of the lawful calling. It was not really an election by the congregation, but it was an assent to the um, decision of the presbytery uh, about uh, installing a pastor in a congregation. There are interesting details in the directory for ordination, but uh, I leave you to explore that on your own. Uh, now just a brief conclusion. The uh, form of church government was never approved as a document by the English Parliament, which had to happen in order for it to become law. Uh, some... Uh, Parts of it were put into an ordinance for church government by the parliament. And uh, under that ordinance, some presbyteries were set up, especially in London. But when Cromwell uh, rose to power, the cavalry commander in the Civil War, um, that became a dead letter because Cromwell was an independent and uh, did not believe in a national church government. And so the presbyteries in, English, in England function only very briefly. And that was really the end of, the, uh, of any substantial influence of this document in England. It was different in Scotland. The form of church government was approved by the General Assembly in February uh, with two exceptions. Uh, they disagreed with the power of the teacher to administer sacraments, and they did not believe the document gave enough power to the people of the church in the calling of ministers. Scotland wanted more than the power of veto. After um, uh, Charles II came to the throne, he put an end to all of the work of the Westminster Assembly in Scotland as well as in England. And uh, so the uh, form of church government did not operate there as a practical guide. Uh, after the uh, revolution settlement in, in uh, 1688, the Church of Scotland went back to an earlier document, the so-called Grand Charter of Presbytery from 1592. And uh, so, again, the form of church government did not have great continuing influence uh, 
except that it was published as a part of a standard collection of documents that included the Westminster Confession of Faith, and in that way uh, came to have a kind of quasi-constitutional uh, position, not only in the Church of Scotland, but uh, also in the dissenting churches that later separated from the Church of Scotland. I'll only mention very briefly the, the thesis of the dissertation now. I mentioned earlier I wanted to study whether it was true that the Scottish commissioners had coerced the Westminster Assembly into adopting their views. I identified 13 in parts of church government that were important to the Scots that they wanted to have established by what they called divine right, that is, that these things were required by the Scripture and must be practiced in the church. And as I studied those 13 issues, I found that the assembly gave the Scots what they wanted on two of the 13. On uh, another uh, five uh, points, the... Westminster Assembly recommended that they be followed but did not require them. And then a third category of even less strength, uh, things that were permitted, uh, they included under that such things as the office of ruling elder and the governing of several congregations by one presbytery. Those are things crucial to Presbyterianism and to the Scots and the Scots were not able to persuade the assembly that these things were biblical and should be required in the Reformed Church of England. Just uh, some concluding reflections. Uh, S.W. Carruthers wrote a book on the everyday work of the Westminster Assembly. The thesis of that book was the... Um, Westminster Assembly of Divines was very human. And uh, so he records from the minutes uh, some of their foibles and uh, like not being there on time or uh, reading the newspaper while the debates were going on and that sort of thing. Another lesson that I take from this is that the Westminster Assembly failed in its stated goal, that is to set up a uh, biblical church government in England. But it was the assembly was used by God in ways that were not originally anticipated. And the production of the Westminster Confession of Faith, and especially the Shorter Catechism, has been a means of blessing of the church literally around the world ever since the time of the Westminster Assembly. And finally, um, sometimes we idealize the Westminster Assembly. As I've said, they were human like us. And I think we ought to draw encouragement from that, that uh, we in our imperfection st can still be used by God in significant ways, perhaps different ways than we anticipate. As God is pleased to do in his providence. So I'll stop with that and we can see if there are questions. Very good, Dr. Spear. And uh, I'll show you up on the screen as we uh, collect some questions right now. Uh, we have uh, bibliography and uh, you can, uh, those of you who are viewing this can I know that's small print, but you can go back and look uh, as you go at the bibliography. And I did want to remind uh, all of you that uh, we do have another webinar coming up uh, on December 5th. And that will be, of course, at 3 o'clock. That's uh, Dr. John Tweed Dale. Uh, he is an adjunct professor, professor here at RPTS and will be speaking on an introduction to Reformed theology. So you'll want to make sure that you uh, also capture that. We do have quite a few questions uh, coming in. Uh, 
Uh, so let's uh, let's get to that. So Dr. Spear, have any churches in recent history, say oh, the last 200 years, adopted the Westminster form of Presbyterian church government? It's uh, quite hard to trace the official actions of uh, churches with regard to uh, to this document. Um, the uh, Church of Scotland, as I've said, did not, uh, after the uh, Revolution settlement, go back to the form of church government. However, when they were engaged in uh, negotiations with the United Free Church in the 1920s, as they talked about their documents, they included in the listing in those negotiations uh, the form of Presbyterian church government. So it's hard to find acts of assemblies that actually adopt this document. But they have, I think because of the association with the Confession of Faith in this collection of documents, as they have what I call a quasi-constitutional uh, status. But uh, I think all American Presbyterian churches, and I think this is also true of the Scottish churches, have uh, documents of their own rather than the form of church government. Uh, Dr. Spear, does your book or your dissertation address the elements of worship as discussed by the assembly? And if so, does it cover the distinction between elements and circumstances of worship? Only uh, in this document, the only reference to the elements of worship is where it talks about the ordinances of a particular congregation. Uh, discussion of those other things came um, in the uh, Directory for Worship and then in the Confession of Faith, both of which specify the parts of worship, I'm not conscious that they use the term elements. The... Uh, Chapter, the first chapter of the Westminster Assembly does talk about the fact that there are some circumstances of worship that are to be decided by Christian prudence in the light of nature, but does not, uh, does not give a listing. Uh, it may be that, and I haven't focused on the minutes behind the Confession of Faith, there may be discussion there, but I'm not aware of that. Another question concerns uh, the role of sessions, and you spoke of uh, the shepherding role of sessions in particular. Uh, had this been a common practice prior to the discussions of the assembly? My sense is that uh, the uh, emphasis upon the shepherding role of ruling elders is a rather recent development. Um, clearly the assembly held what we call today a two-office view of the eldership, uh, perhaps more strongly than is held by most modern Presbyterians because they thought uh, 1 Timothy 3 and Titus 1 applied only to ministers and not to elders. And uh, so they thought primarily of a disciplinary function on the part of ruling elders. And uh, pastoral care was uh, more the, in the province of the pastor uh, rather than the ruling elder. There are uh, a couple of questions on uh, women deacons. And in particular, we have a reference uh, to uh, the work of uh, Lightfoot. But uh, is it true that deaconesses, the deaconess requirement, according to the divines, was that she was a widow and that she focused her unordained ministry on women's mercy and towards those who were pregnant? Okay. The, the discussion does not get into that detail. In general, the assembly was following, I think, Calvin's discussion of uh, the widow in, in the institutes. And uh, so uh, 
there was, but it was passed, as I said, by one ver vote. And Lightfoot said in his journal, if he had been there, he would have voted against it, so it would not have passed. So, uh, but they did not get into det detailed discussion of that. Uh, the background of it, I think, was Calvin's discussion of the office of widow in the institutes. In that same light, since uh, that uh, segment did pass by one vote, uh, you, you mentioned in your talk that quietly uh, that disappeared during the editing process. Uh, is there more information about that? Well, quietly because there's no record of discussion about it. Um, let me go back to another point that was in that question about ordination. Uh, the form of church government, as I've said, says ordination is the setting apart to some office in the church, but after that talks only about the ordination of ministers. So this document and the assembly does not uh, give directions for the ordination of ruling elders or deacons. Uh, and so it's not, uh, that's perhaps not the kind of crucial point for the assembly that it might be today in making a distinction between ordained and unordained diaconal work. Okay. Uh, you mentioned that Ireland was included in the Solemn League and co Covenant uh, without their approval or participation. I, I, uh, you can add some clarity to that, but can you speak to that uh, occurrence? Well, it's just in general, uh, this reflects the, the policy of England toward Ireland, which was uh, not, to, uh, not to respect generally the uh, rights or the opinions of the Irish, but to impose English rule upon them. Um, Archbishop Usher of Ireland was actually named as a member of the assembly in the ordinance, but he declined to attend. And uh, so it's just a reflection of the general policy of England toward Ireland. As I scan the board here, I uh, don't see any further questions. So uh, Dr. Spear, we thank you uh, for your time and obvious passion around this topic and uh, uh, we are sure that many will be blessed uh, by the work that uh, you spent uh, so many hours upon uh, years ago. And Mrs. Spear, we, we thank you for that dedicated typing. Uh, anyone who has prepared a, a paper of substance on a computer today understands how difficult uh, your task must have been. Well, uh, again, as a final reminder, uh, next month, December 5th, uh, Dr. John Tweedale uh, will be uh, taking us through an introduction to reform theology. And uh, this webinar has been recorded. You'll find it uh, available through the seminary's webpage and our YouTube page for your viewing use at some point in time in the future. Well, we thank you for your time today and uh, blessings to you.